Shalom, everybody. It's amazing. The roads. Beautiful time of worship. Yes, You don't want it to end. I lost a stem. <laughs> Parsha, if Rochelle can help me. It's a hard one. Which one? It's a hard one to say. Could I? What does it mean? Reckonings. What are the reckonings? What a celebration. The tabernacle is built and the people are celebrating and the celebration goes on for seven days until the next Shabbat. Until the next but I love this parasha because this par parasha speaks of redemption and God's desire to inhabit his people. Remember that the Israelites were slaves in Egypt. And the miraculous deliverance of coming out of bondage, coming out of Egypt, coming out of slavery. Imagine that. If you've ever been in slavery, you'll know. Amen? You'll know. What does it mean to be in bondage? What does it mean to be enslaved? What does it mean to be combined, combined or confined to a Jewish ghetto? What does that mean? When society tells you, you cannot go beyond these four, this parameter. When we made our missionary trip to Rome and we made our conquests of the Roman ghetto, you remember that, Rochelle, remember that, Francis? Oh, yeah. And we raised that flag at the Arch of Titus. We were making a statement that, yeah, this is where our people were brought to when the temple was destroyed. And the Jews that came out of Judea were dispersed throughout the Roman Empire as slaves. Yes. Imagine that. And the history of the Jewish people, our people, I love that history, especially that history along the Iberian Peninsula, because that's where the Sephardic Jews were dispersed. You know who they are? Those are the Spanish-speaking Jews. And the Spanish-speaking Jews throughout Rome, throughout Italy, throughout Sicily, throughout Spain, throughout Portugal, North Africa, how does the Sephardic Jews end up all the way? How do they end up in San Bernardino, California? They travel far. Well, they immigrated here. <laughs> We're all immigrants. The Jews have been immigrating from nation to nation to nation. What do they seek? A homeland. Listen. A man in Israel, we embrace our heritage. And we're not ashamed to tell the story of that long journey that goes all the way back to
to Egypt, all the way back to our people crying out to Hashem for what? And the redemption that came when he sent a deliverer to Egypt. And these words, let my people go. Who are my people? Who are the people of Hashem? What people was he speaking about? Those were the Hebrew people. And now, Hebrew Christian witness, here we are. Hebrew Christian witness based in San Bernardino, California. What a history. San Bernardino is Pastor Gill's Egypt. I've been trying to get out of here since I was born. <laughs> and I came into this city through my mother's womb. God bless my mother. Who also was born in San Bernardino. And my father was born in San Bernardino. There's a history here in San Bernardino that stretches to the beginning of the 20th century. When my family migrated here from south of the border, in 19, 1908, Whoa. my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, was born in South Colton. Her parents were brought here on a train from Mexico to be slave labor here. And they worked for one dollar a day. 12 hours a day, like slaves, mm -hmm. laying track on the, on the railroad, working in the cement plant, hard labor. Sounds like the Hebrews in Egypt. You know what they did? They worked long hours because they were slaves of Pharaoh. Are we seeing a pattern there? We don't like to be slaves. We don't like to be. We are crying out to our God, save us. Save us. What does God promise when his people cry out to him? He hears them. He hears them. And he always sends a deliverer. That's the history of our people. And so, it's a proud heritage, and I love the history, because it goes all the way back to the beginning. I was telling my wife what I used to tell people on my ship when I was a teenager, that I was a Sephardic Jew, that I am descended from the Levitical priesthood. That's why I wear Levi's. <laughs> the only the only brand that I wear is Levi's to this very day. Why? Because it goes back to the Levitical priesthood. Am I not correct? And San Francisco is where the Levi's were made. So Jewish history goes back a lot of years. But here's the thing. If we are your people, Lord, why are we in bondage? And when is it going to be done? Why would God bring his people out of Egypt only to scatter them among the nations of the world? Curse. Why? Why are they cursed? Why? There is a promise of great blessing in the Torah. But there is a condition. Yes. Your blessing is upon your obedience to what God commands you. And this is what we find in our parasha today. And we're going to be in Exodus and chapter... 
39. And I love it. That part that says the work is completed. And that's verse 32. Amen. Thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished. Now I've got to remember. There are the three R's. Remember the three R's? Those of us who go back to grade school. Back in writing. Reading, writing, and arithmetic. We who come from that generation where the three R's meant reading, writing, and arithmetic. But those three R's became something different to me when I was called to missionary work when I was 16. And it was repentance, restoration, and redemption. And those are the only three R's that I've been interested in. Why? Because you see, before restoration can happen, there has to be repentance. And before restoration happens, that repentance has to happen for that restoration and the restoration of all things, and then the redemption will come. How many of us know that we are waiting for the redemption to come? How many hands? Give me a show of hands. How many are waiting? For the Messiah to come. Well my Bible tells me. That he will suddenly. Be in his holy temple. Which one? There is no temple in Yerushalayim. My temple. Your temple. But tell that to the Jewish people. Who believe that there must be a third temple built. In Jerusalem. And we read about that third temple in the book of Revelation. So when is this work going to be completed? And when will the Messiah come and inhabit the holy sanctuary in Jerusalem? Because right now Jerusalem is not free. Right now Jerusalem is suffering violence as we speak. Right? So, when we talk about the tabernacle, it's a beautiful story of redemption. And it mirrors the seven days of creation. Because after six days, God laid, what happened on the seventh day that we celebrate on Shabbat? He rested. He rested from all his works. There is a day of rest coming. For the people of God. Yeah. And I've got good news. For my people Israel. You're a major part of that. Day of rest. If Joshua had given them rest. He would not have spoken of another day. So we're looking for that eighth day. That day of rest. The day after Shabbat. And that's the day I celebrate. Because you see, on the Shabbat, we look forward when we will enter that rest. It's a foreshadowing of what's to come. But in the meantime, there's work to be done. There's work to be done. And so we see something very beautiful in these verses of Scripture of repentance, and restoration and redemption. And so, thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished, and the children of Israel, and the children of Israel, and the children of Israel, can you repeat with me? And the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moshe. So, they did. What a difference from what they had done before. When Moshe broke those tablets, 
Why did he break the tablets? Because after 40 days on the mountain with God, he receives the Torah written with the finger of God. And what does he find Israel doing? Idolatry. Idolatry. And how did they come about making a God out of gold? And that's the illusion of material wealth. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. And if you don't think that affects the church, read about the Laodicean church in the book of Revelation that they brag about their material wealth. How did the church get so rich? The offerings of the people. How was this tabernacle built? By the offerings of the people. What does that mean? What does God desire happen? Because he created us and he put us on this earth so he will have a dwelling place with man on earth. Has that not always been his desire? Do we not read that the tabernacle of God is with men and that he will dwell with us forever where? On this earth? On earth? That takes us all the way back to the garden when God dwelt with men. Before sin entered the world, we had a beautiful relationship with God. Why would we need repentance? Repentance is when we have sinned against God. But there's always the promise of restoration to restore that relationship with your God. And with that restored relationship comes the restoration of the blessings that were forfeited in disobedience. I'm excited because I know there's going to be a third temple built mm -hmm. in Jerusalem. Even in troublesome times. How many know that's going to happen? Yeah. So the question is, why do the Jews need to build a third temple? And what role does the church play in that prophetic timeline? If the church replaced Israel, then there's no need for a third temple. Because God indwells his church, not a Jewish temple. So help me, Michelle. Why do the Jews need to build a third yeah. temple? Not understanding that they can tabernacle with him one on one in a personal way. They're looking to reestablish the place where they believe God's presence will dwell with them. Well, is, they them. believe that because God told them that's where he would inhabit and his name would be there forever, would be Jerusalem in a temple. Mm -hmm. So it's not the people, it's God told them that. That's what the people are looking to. Well, we only look for what God tells us to look for. And you see, why did the, why did the Israelites do what God, what did they learn from that golden calf experience? God was ready to destroy them as a people, but it had not been for the intercessory prayer of Moshe who is like the intercessory prayer of our Lord Jesus Christ today whoever lives to make intercession for us because how many of us know that we are going to blow it again and again and again do you think that we are perfect now as Christians no. If we were perfect, there would be no need for a rebuke of the church called Laodicea in the book of Revelation before the end times come, that terrible day. Why is the church being warned that what happened to Israel could easily happen to the Christian people where money becomes their God? Do we see that in today's church world? Yeah, we see the opulence, we see the arrogance, we see the pride of rich Christians who are not living 
the godly life that we're supposed to be living, but it seems to be all about the money and the power, especially the political power that goes with that wealth. That's not what God intended, did he? So why do we look at Israel with such disdain? Because they drop the ball time and time again. But what God begins, he's faithful to finish it. And there will be a temple built in Jerusalem, even in troublesome times. So the question is, again, what role do the Christians have in the restoration and redemption of the Jewish people? What role do we have? Depends on your dead job description as a Christian. Bring them back to the gospel. Bring the gospel back to them. Yes. Go out there and make every Jew a Baptist. <laughs> Convert them. Strip well, them of their identity so that they don't do Jewish things. And what they're going to become is just like every other Christian. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that what God ordains? No. 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 Listen. <laughs> We're not in this. To convert them. To become what? Christian Protestants that don't have anything to do with their Jewishness. That's not what I read in the Holy Scriptures. Yes. This restoration is premised upon Israel's repentance, meaning to return to God. We call Israel to repentance. Just the way it has always been from the beginning, that when Israel sinned against God, God always left that door of hope open. In returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and confidence shall be your what? Strength. Strength. Mm -hmm. What we have here is a beautiful story of Israel having to repent of their idolatry and elevate their wealth to that level of spiritual holiness. The purpose of why God blesses us on earth is to glorify Him. Not so that we become slaves to materialism and become slaves to the gold and silver that we see. And so, we find here, and they brought the tabernacle to Moshe. The tent and all its furnishings, its clasp, every individual component mm -hmm. was brought. The pillars, the sockets, the covering, the ramskins, dry bread, the coverings of all all of this we read they brought and we finally get to that point that says according to all that the Lord had commanded Moshe so the children of Israel did all the work the children of Israel the congregation of the people of God did the work we have been given a work to do the tabernacle of David is being rebuilt in these latter days. We read about that in the book of Acts. The restoration of the Jewish people is a big part of the gospel story. So there's no way that you can tell me the church replaced Israel. And that the Jewish people are done. And if that's your doctrine then that doctrine comes from the pit of hell and doesn't come from the Spirit of God. And in no way is the work of God in restoring His people Israel back to Himself. So what role 
does the church have in building that third temple? Think about that. Now, they did it. They did the work. Then Moshe looked over all the work, and indeed, they had done it as the Lord had commanded, just so they had done it, and Moses blessed them. What is Yeshua looking at when he sees his church on earth? Will he be able to look upon the work and say, they did it? Or did the church forget its mission to the Jewish people and to the restoration of the children of Israel? Are we not co-laborers with Yeshua? Was Moshe not a type of the coming Messiah? And isn't it the Lord himself that will gather his people, Israel, out of all the nations, and he will resettle them back to the land that had been promised to their fathers? Is that not part of the gospel story? Yes. I advocate for Jewish missionary work in the churches, and the churches have a responsibility to use the wealth that God has blessed the church with, not to turn the church against Israel, but to be there to help Israel build that temple. The work completed. So now go with me to the church side of the Bible. To Luke's Gospel, chapter 16. And beginning at verse 1, we read, He also said to his disciples, There was a certain rich man, a rich Laodicean Christian, who had a steward. Who's the rich man in the parable? And who's the steward in the parable? And why is Jesus telling this to his disciples? What is he teaching them? The danger of material wealth. When God is blessing you materially, we have a stewardship to use what God gives us for the building of his dwelling place. We see that in the tabernacle story. We see the day of reckonings when they were what? All this tallying up of all the contributions of all that, and all of that working together was completing the work of building the tabernacle. Because what happened when the tabernacle was built, Rochelle? Who filled? The Shekinah glory filled the tabernacle. What does that mean? God returned to his people in his tabernacle. He dwelt among them. What a beautiful story. How many want God to indwell us? God to, to his glory to shine through us. Amen. Once again, open your heart a little deeper. What does this parable have to do with that tabernacle story? Everything. Because everything Jesus did ties to what we read about in the days of Moshe. Why? Because Israel had been promised that there would be another like Moshe. And what is Israel supposed to do? Hear him. He's not coming to replace Israel with another building. No. He's coming to fulfill the promise of redemption that had been promised to the children of Israel from the very beginning. That's the beautiful story that I read from Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. It is a story of Israel's repentance, restoration, and redemption. I love that story. 
It's a continual story. And so, here are the disciples of Jesus, and he's telling them a story about a certain rich man who had his steward. And an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. How can we waste our material wealth? We're squandering it. Imagine having all this wealth as a church and not using any of it for Jewish missionary work. Would that not be a little bit part of the squandering? Mm -hmm. What role does the church have in Jewish missionary work? To help. What role do we have as individual Christians when it comes to Jewish missionary? Because the scripture says this, that we are being built up a holy habitation. When did the living stones that are being perfectly fit into this building that God is building not include the Jewish people? Not include the children of Israel? Think about that. And so, Squandering. What is this I hear about? You give an account, give a reckoning of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. What did the children of Israel do with their wealth after they returned to God in repentance after the golden calf? What did they do? They used it to build the tabernacle of God instead of building a false God. And so Jesus is teaching this truth. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking this stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I have resolved what to do. That when I am put out of this stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. Who are they? Who's being put out? The unfaithful steward. Who wants to be homeless? but that they may bring us into their houses. Key point. Why do we advocate for mission houses? Because when those churches are closed down by the government for taxes, where are they going to go? Jesse Place. They're going to come to the Jesse house. <laughs> They'll come to the Ukaipa house. They'll come to, to our mission houses. Why? And we will welcome them with open arms. Jews and Gentiles becoming one in Yeshua. Are you sort of getting the picture? You see, just because you think you're so rich that you can't be purged out by Jesus who's not happy with what you're doing with his what? Resources. Read the book of Revelation. Read what was warned to the Laodicean church that they were so proud, they were so arrogant about their gold, that they had become so rich, right? That they, their, their, their preachers travel in private jets and drive Rolls Royces from function to function. And we built mega churches and have hundreds of thousands of members. But of those people, how many are you training for Jewish missionaries? How many missionaries are you sending out to the children of Israel worldwide? And do you think that God is happy with that? When you squander his wealth and neglect his people Israel because they're part of the redemption story. So I ask the question again, what role does the church have in Jewish 
missionary work in these latter days as we prepare for the coming of the Messiah. Are we not to be engaged in preparing the way for the coming of the Lord? Yeah. Was John not a Baptist evangelist? Was he not evangelizing the Jewish people? Yeah. Absolutely right. When did we cease doing Jewish evangelism? You see, it begs the question. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, how much do you owe my master? So what's happening here? Is he committing fraud? Is he cheating his master of what right he could become? Or are not those indebted to his master being released of their debts? The greatest release of debt is what God offers his people. Return to me, and I will return to you. But yeah. how? Good question. I'm glad you brought that up. Because Christian preachers use this to get tithes and offerings from the people. In tithes and offerings. This is the only part of the Torah in the Tanakh that they use when it comes to money. Everything else has been replaced. Except that. So let's use the Jewish scriptures to persuade the people to bring their tithes and offerings into the church so we can build a mega church. But let's not take any of those tithes and offerings and use one dollar towards Jewish missionary work. Do we see a disconnect there? Do we have a problem there? And you think that the Lord is not going to require an accounting of you? Is There's not going to be a day of reckoning? That's what our parish is about. It's about reckonings. Why the accounting of all that they brought so that this work can be completed? Yeah. Church has a stewardship to the Jewish people, and if you don't fulfill it, then you will be removed from that stewardship. That will happen. Because Jesus said to the Laodicean church, you're rich, but you're, you're poor. You're spiritually bankrupt. You don't see, you don't hear, you don't understand. I counsel you to buy gold from me refined in the fire that you may be rich and garments that are not going to be soiled garments how many have read about the church of Laodicea yeah. and are we not talking about the modern day church today <laughs> that's so idolatrous that the heart has turned so far away from the truth and it's all about the money. And this is what Yeshua was warning his disciples. Don't make money your God. And so, what happens? His master commends him for what? Dealing Shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. What is this shrewdness? And what did this steward do? what pleased his master. So I'm gonna ask this question. When is Jesus the master never pleased that you are reaching his people Israel with the gospel? When is Jesus going to rebuke the church for taking its resources and using them for Jewish missionary work? Shrewdness. Shrewdness. 
we're going to take this church and we're going to dedicate it to Jewish missionary work. That was our decision years ago. And from this, we're going to open up mission houses all over the world because we see the writing on the wall that the days are evil and the church's influence is, is waning in the world. And the world is becoming increasingly wicked and there are fires blazing all over the world. And guess what? The world is out to carry out the will of the dragon and that's to destroy the children of Israel. Our mission houses are open doors to the Jewish people to come and fellowship with us. Let's tabernacle with God together as one people of God. Amen? But how do you determine who is a Jew? It's not a question of who's a Jew. It's a question. Rochelle's a Jew. Because I'm a Jew. Okay? Understand that. Okay? Yeah. There are yeah. people who are Jewish. Okay, who's a Jew? Do you stop being a Jew when you become a Christian? No. That's a division. That division was built by the Christian church to divide the Jew no, from the scriptures. Christians. It's in scriptures. It, in scriptures? Yes. Replacement theologists will tell you that. No. There's no wall of division. It must be torn down by the faithful remnant that we read about in the book of Revelation. No, the faithful ones that are dealing with the Jewish issue. Because that's the church that deals with the Jewish people. The church has a role to play in these latter days in bringing us together as one. United together as one. Not divided Jew between Christian, but that we are one people of God and understand that God never removed the apostleship from the Jewish people. And he is restoring that priesthood that is an everlasting priesthood to the Jewish people. Because if you read in this week's parasha that the priesthood is an everlasting priesthood. Can you go to that Rochelle and go back to the parasha? That priesthood was to be eternal everlasting priesthood. It's talking about that Levitical priesthood. And when you read about the restoration that's coming in the days of Elijah, it's to restore that and purify the Levitical priesthood. That's why I'm wearing my Levi shirt today. <laughs> What's the purpose of purifying the priesthood of Israel? Preparing it for the coming of the Messiah. God's not done with Israel's priesthood. They will always be God's holy people, God's holy nation, that royal priesthood. God's royal priesthood. God's royal priesthood. The church did not replace that. Did you find it, Rochelle? Not the everlasting. I'm in it, but I'm not. I'm overlooking it. I'm looking too fast. Listen. Well, Pastor Gil, you're on. <laughs> because our ministry because comes God under attack by the replacement theologists. Every week we have to deal with those, those people in high theological places that insist that we are doing it wrong. No. Well, we have, we have to actually let them who, who are attacking us so we can fight them. We don't, we don't all attack them. No, we don't all attack them. But I'm going to tell you what. Who's a Jew? Yes, who's a Jew? Who is a Jew? A Jew is one who is circumcised of heart. Remember, we defined that. And it's simply this. We are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Who rejoice in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. What does that mean? We rely on the Holy Spirit to be perfecting us in holiness. And if we rely on the Holy Spirit, money's got nothing to do with anything. Your spiritual life, that spiritual journey, that spiritual odyssey that we're all on, leading to perfection, 
doesn't exclude the children of Israel. We're all part of that journey. The Messiah will come. And he will fill his temple with his Shekinah glory, with his, his glory, with his radiance. And once again, there is a priesthood. And it is an everlasting priesthood. Okay? Did you find it? I, I don't like it's in our parish, it and, and it's very important for us to understand that priesthood and why. Forty and verse fifteen. Forty and verse fifteen, and this is what we read in forty and fifteen. And this is this is what it says here. And I'm going to read it, and it just says, "Then you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and wash them with water. You shall put the holy garments on Aaron and anoint him and consecrate him, that he may minister to me as priest. And you shall bring his sons and clothe them with tunics. You shall anoint them, and as you anointed their father." that they may minister to me as priests, for their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Everlasting means what? Everlasting. Ever and ever. <laughs> that priesthood is an everlasting priesthood. But it was a corrupt priesthood. So what does that do to these words in our parasha? The words true. These words are eternal. So what does that say about the Levitical priesthood throughout their generations? So what happens when a Jewish person comes to the saving faith in Yeshua? Is God raising up that priesthood? from among the Jewish people who are going to be sent back to the Jewish people to finish the work. Okay. Because when God says everlasting, he means it. And so I will wrap it up going back to this here. Back to 16 and Luke 16, and we read on. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into ever, an everlasting house. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much, and he who is unjust in much <coughs> in what is least is unjust also. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you, to your trust, the true riches? You see, why was it so important to end the book of Exodus on that note of reckonings? To itemize and give a tell you all that the children of Israel bought, brought in abundance from their riches to build the tabernacle of God according to how God commanded Moshe, so the people did. You see, we are being built a spiritual house that God will indwell. And there's no middle wall to divide us between Jew and Gentile. We are all one in Yeshua. And that is a beautiful picture of redemption. But the three R's is repentance. And God promises to restore the fortunes of the children of Jacob when they do return to him. And what follows that restoration is redemption. We want the Messiah to come. 
and so. No servant can serve two masters, for either he'll hate the one and, and love the other, or he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Well, last I heard, mammon is material wealth. And material wealth can blind you. Material wealth can become a golden cap idol to you, coming between you and God. Wealth came between God and his people Israel. We read about that story in the prior parashas, but look at God's restoration and look at God dwelling in his tabernacle. Did the people have cause to celebrate for seven days? And do you know that they tore down that tabernacle at the end of each day and rebuilt it every day? What is that all about? Building up, tearing down, building up, tearing down six times, and then what? Because we're looking forward to a time when that tabernacle will never, ever be destroyed again. And God will forever dwell with his people. Israel being light to the nations of the world. That's what I read about in the Bible. Oh, Pastor Gill, you're so pro-Israel. You're so pro-Jewish people. I liked you better when you were just a Christian. Well, we don't see as being who we are. We're just fulfilling what God has commanded us to do. Amen. Amen? Amen. So, this priesthood will be cleansed. And it will be purged. Malachi, are you ready? To set you up for the next message? Because those days have been promised will come before that great and terrible day of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I know we're all looking forward to that. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Malachi. Chapter 3. Boom. Yes. And here we go. Chapter 3 verse 1 says, Behold, I send my messenger. And he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come where? To his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's soap, a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of who? The sons of the Christian church or the sons of Levi? Why do they need refining? The sons of Levi are the ones we read about in our parasha that are what? They are a royal priesthood they're an everlasting priesthood what god begins he's faithful to complete it he's not done with the jewish people because he's going to refine and purify their priesthood and again and purge them as gold and silver that he may offer to the lord an offering in righteousness it doesn't sound to me that the priesthood of Israel is replaced. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years, like what we read about in our parasha that they were celebrating day after day after day because the tabernacle was complete and the Shekinah glory returned to Israel. Hallelujah. What a beautiful picture of Redemption. But before that redemption, there has to be a restoration of that royal priesthood. They have to be refined. They have to be purified. <clears throat> Buy gold from me refined in the fire. Church. <clears throat> because I'm getting ready to purge you out. Doesn't sound like the Lord is pleased with the church that forgot about God in their well, 
in their opulence. Mm -hmm. And again, he says, as in former years, and I will come near you for judgment, I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against I adulterers against perjurers, against those who exploit word journals and widows and orphans and against those who turn away an avian because they do not fear me, says the Lord God. Be careful how you treat foreigners. Be careful how you treat aliens, how you treat the poor and the needy of the land. Because if you're going to exploit them, if you're going to, to kick them out of your rich churches, there's a day of reckoning coming for you. Remember the poor, because the poor you have with you always. Israel, without Yeshua, is spiritually bankrupt. Church, you are the pillar of truth on this earth. And you have a stewardship responsibility to do the work of the messenger so that the sons of Levi can be purified. Because the only refining fire that refines the heart is the Spirit of God. And the only way that you can receive the gift of God, which is the Holy Spirit, is by putting your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ. Yes. There's no other way. For I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. I believe that's all the Jewish people. So that should answer your question, Tony. Who are the Jews, the sons of Jacob? Those are the physical descendants of Jacob. But how you determine in terms of physical things? If we said people like that, how do you determine? Well, we all have an ancestry going back to somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. How are you going to accomplish that in the latter days if you can't figure out who the Jewish people are? Can God, does God know their DNA? Does God know who they are, where they are? How is he going to seek them out if he can't identify them? We leave, we leave that to God himself. God will draw his people to himself. He will draw them out. It's not for us to say, well, you're a Jew, you're not a Jew. No, 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 no. We don't want that because Hitler used that to exterminate the Jewish That's people. That's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is simply this. It's not a matter of what. Uh, how do you call that word? Semantics? It's about this. God knows who his no, people no, no. Israel are. He, he knows see. where they are, where he they're hidden, and how to bring them out. Identification means... Here, there, and everywhere. Yeah. All around. Yes. 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 That's why you have to go and find out. If you, 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 Where we are? You're in a house full of Jews. No, no, no. I'm talking about when you travel. No. Well, our mission field right now happens to be where we're at. And guess what? Are we not having a good Jewish missionary work here in San Bernardino? It's been here since the 1950s. Hebrew Christian Witness didn't come two weeks ago. It's been around a long time. How did God bring it to the forefront in these latter days? What is God doing through a ministry that, that was birthed right here in this city of San Bernardino? How can God do that? He raised it up. He's doing it. That, that's a given. Oh. And there's a great Jewish missionary work going on in Palm Desert. Same thing. How are, where is God raising up these ones that are going to call his people? One on one. Absolutely. That's not about what we're talking about here. One on one, yes. Okay? One on one. Yes. You bring and invite them to your home. You bring them to your home. You sit and you, you reach out in love and in unity. Do the Jewish people need that from the people worldwide? When a world hates them and wants to destroy them? We're here to tell you. Israel and the Jewish people that we are your friends. We will stand with you in solidarity no matter what. But we're not going to withhold from you the truth. 
that salvation is in Yeshua and there's no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. And so, he says it again. God will be pleased. He will inhabit his sanctuary. Right? I am the Lord, I do not change. Therefore you're not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Yet from the days of your father you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me and I will return to you. The question is how? And in our next message, we will get into the how. Amen? Amen. Amen. It's all yours, Rochelle. And I love this man. <laughs> Believe me. That's what I need to tell you, Lord. You're terrible? You're not terrible. No, no, no. I mean, there's more I need to tell you. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> Never say you're terrible. <laughs> Ivan was the terrible, not you. <laughs> Praise God, his word is faithful. And Amen. what he said, he will do. And there is that day coming. And we do look forward to that day. I look forward to that millennial temple yes. that will be filled when Yesha, who saw the, the, just the train, just what yes. the, the end of his robe filled that whole temple. When we read that Moshe could not even go into his tent when the glory of the Lord the glory was so filled. Hallelujah. Those days are coming. But yes, Pastor Gil is right on target. It is a royal Jewish priesthood that God has perpetually established. Yes, it needs reform. Where are you today? Where are the sons of Levi today? If they cease to exist, they happen to be the only one that DNA marker has marked. So far. The yes. Kohanim. Yeah, so yeah. far. <laughs> All I'm trying to tell you is that I'm descended from the Kohanim. That's been <laughs> DNA proven. <laughs> and God found me because I wasn't looking for him. <laughs> he knows where to find his people. Yes. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's you. <laughs> he says, no. And I hear my dad. Yeah, and God is so good. My dad is blessed memory. I think about two weeks after he had found Yeshua as his Messiah. I'll go anywhere you want me to go, God. I'll tell anybody I can of you. I'll be your your witness. But don't send me to my own people. They're too hard. <laughs> With joy, he spent every day of the rest of his life in ministry to reach his own Jewish people with the truth that Yeshua, Jesus, is Messiah, is Savior, and that he has come to redeem. Yes, Israel, your redemption draws nigh. And may we take that precious Jewish gospel. I'll say it honestly, because he talked about money today. Does the Gentile, does the church, and I'll put that word in quotes, but you know what I mean. Do they owe anything to the Jew? Yes. 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 They yes. owe a debt of a gratitude Jew. because this word of God going for next. is from the Jews. Because the Messiah is Jewish. Because he did establish the Jewish nation to be his light to the world. So yes, we thank the Jew for keeping the word of God yeah. and for bringing it down to us. Yeah. And now I heard someone say it during Pastor Gill's time, now we need to take it back to them. Mm -hmm. And I yes. like that word back because back. that's where it came mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. So yes, yes. We're united one heart and soul and purpose here. We are all on the same team. It is Team Yeshua. <laughs> and it is that we might share. We want all to hear. We want all to come to salvation. But Israel right now is in a time of great need. And she needs someone standing in the gap. Mm -hmm. She needs prayer intercessors. Pick up the papers on the global fast, the, the fast of Esther. Because when you look at that book of Esther today, you're going to look at it different than you did a year ago. Because of what happened on October 7th. Mm -hmm. 
Is it a wake-up call for Israel? Yes. I pray it to be so. Because even out of the ashes of the Holocaust, God birthed a nation, brought back the rebirth of Israel in the day. He knew October 7th. That was not something that caught him off guard. But how beautiful if we can see in time many come to saving grace mm -hmm. because of that tragedy. That's, That's the redemption that would be so beautiful. And America needs to wake up. America should be here. America from needs generation to generation anyway. Lament from here, from generation to generation. The, the My whole siblings, door your the siblings, their siblings will be there until the fourth the fourth temple will be here. <laughs> yes. And Tony's going all the way to where I like to go to. And how beautiful that we know it will be because God said so. That's our faith. Hallelujah. We can take yeah. it to the bank. Let's close in a word of prayer and then we can have conversation go on. But let's yeah. give glory to our God whose yeah. glory shall be the glory. That. Heaven came down I'm sorry. and filled the earth. I didn't know that I have uh, replaced, replacement theologies in my house. <laughs> so somebody has to sleep in the garage tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I have a feeling it's more misunderstood than believed. <laughs> we know your heart. <laughs> I have a 1-800 number that comes to us. We, we extract replacement theology from your home. We call no, it exorcism. Yes, we were just, uh, uh, we were in replacement theology, he and me, yesterday. And that's not, that's, that's, that the discussion was very, very good. good. We are not replacement theologists. No. Never. No. Never, never. No. I would fear for the, the called out assembly today were God to have replaced the Jew because of their rebelliousness. Mm -hmm. Look at the church today. Yeah, but sadly, they, they yes. need to stand in fear also. Yes, and I remember Rowena was telling me uh, last week or this week that somebody confronted her in church mm -hmm. about this. Sorry about this one, mm -hmm. and he, yeah, he, yeah, he's from IBC, and uh, Ruida said it's a good thing that I know where I stand, mm -hmm. and I, I really appreciate her for that. Mm -hmm. And what touched me is she said she knew yeah. the scriptures, she knew the word of God, she right. knew where to go to knock out the false. Yeah, and, and that's I what we all need. We need to know the word of God. That yeah. Well. That's why you need to sharpen. Sharpen yeah. the sword. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and I told, I told her, yes, you know, uh, it seems to me that our churches are really going there, going to walk and this, going to the replacement theology thing. And I wonder if uh, it has also uh, like penetrated the seminaries. The well, that's where it's coming out.